but yes, hello. Uh, I am really pleased and, and honored to be here with the artward bound folks. Um, I actually was around at the very beginnings of the creation of this program. And um, also sometimes it's the feeder into folks, you folks in Artward Bound who you can um, go ahead and start to attend Mass Art, generally become a part of the Compass Program, which we'll probably know about. And I've also been a part of that. Um, so yeah, I've been around Mass Art a long time and that will be a major focus of my um, a little talk at the beginning of this in terms of career day. So um, as I blather at you all at the beginning, I'm going to put on a slideshow of my work. Uh, yeah, let me just, before I do that, uh, just talk a little bit about the introduction. So yep, I am an alum of MassArt and I teach at MassArt. Uh, I actually started, I first attended the Massachusetts College of Art, as it was called, in 1978. And so mass art has been a part of my adult life. I will, I will confess to you all, I am now 64 years old. It amazes me <laughs> that I'm here, which again is another part of, of my talk. Because actually, I'm going to keep it kind of real for you all, because... You know, most of you all live in Boston or in a major city, um, you know, so there's some real pressures that we live under uh, in these circumstances. So um, the way I think I'm going to do this, I am going to put on a slideshow and just have it cycle through uh, and then... Um, and I'm gonna talk about how I got to this point where I am now, as you all are looking at these images. So as you're looking at these, there are sort of four bodies of work that you're gonna look at. Uh, the first one is called Within Our Gates, and it is a series, there are 13 paintings in this series thus far of large landscapes that are based on lynching sites in this country. And this is work that I started when I was in grad school. Uh, maybe I'll talk a little bit at some point about how I kind of came to this project, but it felt really important to me to, to document places where mostly black folks, uh, a few white folks have been lynched in this country as part of documenting and putting in a different context, American history. Um, uh, yeah, it's American history. It's not just African American history. Then the next uh, batch of slides, few slides, is from a project called In the Interest of Empire. And in 2005, uh, most of you, if you were here, were still very young. <laughs> um, but this country had started a war, invaded Iraq, and I went to Iraq with a peacekeeping mission as part of a project. I was curious about flowers in a war zone. Uh, so that's the project that came out of that. Uh, then the next group of slides uh, is titled Black Lives. It was, started, it was conceived in about 2015, uh, not too long after Michael Brown was murdered uh, by a cop, executed, tortured. Well, not even, he wasn't tortured in the same way that um, George Floyd was most recently. Uh, but anyway, I knew that I needed to make some sort of contribution to or have my piece of the Black Lives Matter movement and trying to figure out what I could do as an artist. And then the last uh, three, three paintings now um, is, a, is my most current series of paintings and it's called Marks of a Native Son. And they are slightly larger than life-size self-portraits, full-body portraits. And as I say, I'm 64 years old. I am now <laughs> um, officially a senior citizen, <laughs> which is great because I get $2 off of uh, movie tickets. We can go back to see the movies. And uh, I guess next year I'll be eligible for Medicare or Medicaid, whichever one it is. Um, so, Marks of a Native Son, it's really an autobiographical series, just kind of looking back over my life. 
Um, to some degree, kind of, it's a, it's a like, how did I get here kind of series? And this is how I got here kind of series. So how did I get here? And if anybody has any questions, um, just kind of go ahead and, and pop in. I really want this to be much more of a conversation uh, than sort of me lecturing at you all. So let me just tell you my kind of life story, career, how I got here part first, and then we can um, ideally have a conversation. So um, as a kid, I always loved to draw and paint. Um, I was also really curious about things. One of the things that my, my father and brother, I have two siblings, I'm the youngest of three, but my father and brother used to always complain when I was a little kid that I always take things apart. But it's because I was curious to understand how things worked, right? So um, that's, that's me as a, as a little kid, always loved to draw and paint. Um, I was born in Gary, Indiana, a very sort of fortunate middle-class life. We then moved to Denver, Colorado, and then uh, Sacramento, California, which is where I went to high school. There was actually in high school that maybe aspects of my future started to um, really reveal themselves in several different ways. And as I say, I'm going to keep it kind of real with you all. Uh, so one of the ways it was really important that it began to um, unfold for me in high school this again is like in the 1970s. So it's kind of the end of the hippy dippy days. And there were lots of murals at the high school that I went to in California. So I asked my art teacher, who got to paint the murals? And the person said, you do if you want to. And that was just what I needed to hear. So I went on to paint, I can't remember, but like five or six major murals at this high school. Unfortunately, I don't have photographs of them Maybe they are in the archives of El Camino High School where I attended. Um, but I also had some challenges in school. I, I learned later that I am dyslexic. So I had challenges with reading. I was always a curious student. I was always willing to try, but having to write stuff was a real challenge for me. So I was able to secure class credit for several of the murals that I painted. And that was definitely one of the things that helped me to graduate high school. Uh, so after high school, like a lot of folks, I had no idea really what I was going to do. Uh, but there was a junior college, it's now a four-year college, that I went to and for a couple of years and took what was essentially uh, my foundation year, first year of mass art, but two years. And I put together a really strong portfolio. I was really into art. I learned all kinds of great stuff. Some of my first experiences doing silkscreen printing, uh, pen and ink. Um... So anyway, it was, it was a really great couple of years for me. Simultaneously, though, you know, I was like, I don't know, what, 17, 18, 19 years old, and I was starting to make a lot of the kind of bad choices that sometimes people make in their late teens coming into their adulthood. So um, as a way to kind of at least get me out of familiar locations where there was lots of trouble for me to get into, and as I say, I was like literally headed towards some, some really, I was making bad choices, put it that way. Um, my sister was living in Boston at the time. So in November of 1976, I got on an airplane and uh, flew out to Boston and moved in and shared space with my sister for a couple of years. And a couple of years in Boston, I, well, actually, it's probably within that first year, um, I met, maybe you all have heard of, Paul Goodnight. Uh, it's an amazing artist and was one of the first people I got to meet in, um, in Boston, uh, as well as Aqua Homes, 
Um, and these were all folks who were friends of my sister. Uh, so I don't exactly remember how it happened, but at some point I took my portfolio over to Mass Art and I was essentially uh, seeking ad advice for employment. Uh, I probably was about 21 at the time and um, I must have had a conversation with the Dean of Admissions. And actually I did have a conversation with the Dean of Admissions. I came to realize later, uh, a person named Kay Ransdow at the time. And uh, Kay Ransdow said to me, you should go to Mass Art. <laughs> and sure enough, I uh, started my first couple of years at Mass Art. And I came in because I had this storm, strong portfolio, I came in as a, um, as a sophomore into the graphic design department, it was called at the time. And um, graphic design was not a good fit for me. And I realized after that first challenging year that I really wanted to learn how to paint and draw. Switched into the painting department. Uh, was starting to have a really good time, although, you know, it was a challenge struggling, um, making good art, learning how to do that. And uh, some stuff happened with my family back in Sacramento, such that I had to drop out of mass art for uh, about 10 years uh, because of financial reasons. Um, and in the interim, uh, a couple of really important things happened in my life, many important things in the 10 year span from when I had to drop out in 1980 to when I returned in 1990 uh, to finish my undergraduate degree. Um, not insignificant of all of that, I got sober. As I said, I was making some really bad choices in my late youth, early adulthood, uh, but I got sober started a family, uh, had a small business, silkscreen printing. Um, so yeah, and the, the silkscreen printing, after a while, uh, I realized I wasn't, and I had two other partners, we were not making our own art. We were always scrambling to silkscreen other people's art. So I quit the business just kind of walked away from it, got a table saw out of the deal, and uh, a, lack, uh, a reduction of stress, and came back to Mass Art to finish up my undergraduate degree in 1990. Um, I graduated Mass Art in 93, and uh, actually worked as a carpenter for a while, I did some substitute teaching. I was actually a long-term substitute teacher at Madison Park, which is definitely one of my best experiences as a teacher. Uh, in many ways, very challenging, uh, but it was, it was good. And I actually, there are a few students who I still think about and, and would love to know what they are doing these days. So, um, in 1996, I decided to attend grad school. Uh, at this point, I was the parent of two kids. And um, for whatever reasons, and there are lots of reasons, um, my, their mother and I split up. Uh, and again, like all this stuff is just kind of important and relative to my life trajectory. Um, some of you may know the Piano Factory building uh, on Tremont Street. So that's where I was fortunate to raise my kids. Um, it's a really great, wonderful environment. Um, so anyway, I get, got into to grad school, uh, went to the museum school, it was right down the street. I uh, had thought about going to school at the Chicago Art Institute. I was accepted and I was also accepted at um, whatever the art school was called in Oakland, California. And um, I was very close to going to Oakland because I could have uh, lived with my father who lived in Sacramento, um, San Francisco at the time. And, um, but I opted to stay in Boston because I really didn't want to be on the other side of the country for my kids. So anyway, went to the museum school, 
had some challenges there that a lot of people go through in grad school, but I graduated and finished in 99, but my degree says 2000. And I had no idea what I was going to do. Um, just before I finished up uh, my Master of Fine Arts, I um, attempted to apply to the um, School of Ed, and I was going to become a um, social studies uh, history teacher. Uh, but the wise folks at Tufts did not accept me into the program. They, they kicked me out. They said, you got your MFA, go, do something else. And one of my professors from MassArt called me up and asked me if I um, wanted to teach at MassArt. And I said, absolutely, I would like to teach at MassArt. And that was, she called me, Marcia Lloyd called me in the spring. Actually, it was the, the winter of 2000. And I started teaching um, that fall. Uh, and I've been at MassArt ever since. And through lots of trials and tribulations, eventually have become a full professor. So, in terms of occupations, I have been really blessed in the ways that being an artist has, for the most part, also been able to provide me with sufficient income to feed myself, sometimes just barely, but enough. And mostly that has been through teaching and primarily at mass art. Um, So in some ways, you know, my career trajectory has been in some ways almost like a straight line from the time I got to Boston um, to where I am now. And I've been very blessed and fortunate in that um, the ways that mass art has been so pivotal, pivotable, can't say that word, in my life and in my life trajectory. So in a lot of ways, that's, that's really um, kind of my career trajectory. But the, so the body of work, I'll, I'll, t I'll talk about two. Uh, the first one, which is within our gates, and then the last one, Marks of a Native Son. So this work, and I'm getting to the beginning of it, um, within our gates, sight and memory in the American landscape. So I've always really loved landscape painting. Um, and I'm not sure if it was exactly in, in undergraduate or in graduate school, but I came to understand that in terms of art history, the, the so-called Hudson River School was the first indigenous school of painting in the United States of America. So landscape painting has this historical significance. And as I said, I've always really kind of liked landscapes. The murals that I painted back in high school were these sort of fantasy landscapes that I just invented out of my, um, out of my head. Uh, so as I started to learn about the historical significance of landscape, I decided I wanted to make a contribution to this. Um, but I was also sort of thinking about, okay, me, I'm a city boy. What is my rapport to the land in America? And what kinds of things do I want to do with that? And uh, we don't really have enough time today to talk about exactly how I came to this project. But lynching as a phenomenon in the United States, that kind of vigil anti uh, violence was a thought that was always in the back of my mind. And I thought initially that I was going to do portraits of trees where people were lynched when I came up with this project. Uh, so I had the idea to do a series of tree portraits where people had been lynched. I set up a road trip for myself 
headed off down south and realized that um, identifying individual trees was going to be impossible. Uh, and just settled on sort of a more landscape view of it. Um, also, these paintings are on can uh, linen, you know, and I, so the, the project, I wanted to make these monumental or near monumental sized landscapes in the vein of the Hudson River School uh, that would be monuments and memorials to victims of lynching. Um, so I go to these places, I take a photograph of what they look like in their current um, state, and then make the, come back to my studio and make the paintings. Many of these locations are still dangerous places to go to. Uh, let's see, actually, up this way. When I was taking the photograph for this painting, the photographs, I was underneath this bridge and um, was this a, no, actually it's not this one, it's similar kind of view. But anyway, I was parked, I was underneath the bridge figuring out what was going to be the most interesting uh, viewpoint. And I heard a car pull up, park. I heard people get out and kind of walk around. And um, as soon as I heard their car leave, I got in my car and split because it just felt really dangerous. Um, uh, this painting is uh, the site where Matthew Shepard, a uh, young college kid, gay kid, was lynched in um, Wyoming. Uh, again, a similar sort of circumstance where um, I arrived in Laramie, Wyoming, I'm trying to figure out where the location of this lynching took place. So I thought, well, I know, I'll ask the police, because they'll surely know where it took place. Um, so I, I went to the police station and was talking to someone through some weird intercom system. And they told me that uh, it was on private property. And if I went there, I would be trespassing. <laughs> so again, to make a, a long story short, I called the gallery at the uh, University of Wyoming um, uh, art gallery and spoke to a student, a dulcet there, and uh, that person found someone who directed me to the site. Right? So again, I was just really lucky. But it felt really important for me to also include um, a diversity of people who have been lynched. Uh, I still have yet to do the painting uh, where the victim was a woman, uh, but I do have the photographs of that. So um, this is a white gay kid, there's one uh, this took place, Cape Cod, Massachusetts, this lynching site. Um, so that's kind of the process. Uh, I don't have a... Um, my primary source material uh, for this project is a one book called uh, 100 Years of Lynching which is a, essentially a, um, an archive of newspaper articles that would sort of describe in general terms the location. And that's what I use to find places. And I'll just zoom. The, the other one I'll talk about a little bit. Um, maybe because it's in many ways closest to my heart right now. Although this particular project, the Black Lives, has gotten a lot of attention and I'm actually excited to do a few more of these drawings um, probably over the winter. Um, but Marks of a Native Son, actually let me just back up one moment. So the title Within Our Gates is also the title of a film by the filmmaker Oscar Michaud, it's African American, made was a very early filmmaker, and his film that's called Within Our Gates was 
his response to uh, D.W. Griffith's very racist film called Birth of a Nation. And in um, Michelle's film, Within Our Gates, it culminates in a lynching. Um, so the title of my series is, a, is to honor Oscar Michelle. And then Marks of a Native Son is a, uh, is inspired, the title is inspired by James Baldwin, who all of you should be reading if you haven't already, uh, Notes of a Native Son. Um, and as I said, this one is just kind of an autobiographical. Let's see. So. And um, so it's a portrait within a portrait. And uh, so this is me many years ago and my two children. Keel and Kina, uh, and you will see me as an adult two years ago, three years ago, and my daughter. And Keel is not there because Keel uh, was a victim of fentanyl. Um, so as I said, you know, <laughs> I certainly did not expect when um, when Keel was this age that. Uh, I would be the father of a deceased child uh, 10 years later. Is that right? No, it's actually a little bit more like 20 years later. Um, so I've had in many ways a very blessed life, and yet I have had my own um, tragedy. So this, this painting has inspired the continuing series of uh, just these, this autobiographical. So um, this one is just kind of a very personal story of, of my traumatic love life that we all have sometimes. <laughs> I'm happy to say that there's good news at the end of this story. And then um, this one, which is the most recent one that I've completed, the title is, uh, Tell me that cherry tree story again, because fuck you and your lies, also known as cherry tree lies. And it's really sort of me thinking about my last name, Washington, and how it is that I have the last name Washington. Um, and all the stuff around George Washington could not tell a lie. Yes, he chopped down the cherry tree, and he also owned people that looked like me. Right. And so a lot of the narrative of the United States is wrapped up in this mythology of these great, noble white men who founded this country, who also owned people that look like me and raped the people that look like me that have female bodies and probably some male bodies as well. So like our history is fraught with lots of painful stuff and deceptions. So you can't really see it in the slide, uh, but buried deep in the background of this painting is a scene from a 1919 mass lynching that happened in Elaine, Arkansas, where over 200 people um, were murdered. These were sharecroppers, farmers, and all they wanted were some living <laughs> wages for their, their work and were murdered. So again, like just thinking about Washington, um, you know, I have no idea what my ancestral family name would have been. All right, then as the kind of co-host for this, I will uh, open it up for questions for everyone. So I know that some people were putting questions in the chat, so we're going to open it up for people to directly uh, more for like official questions. So if you had a question before, you can put it in the chat if you want um, maybe me or another mentor or teacher here to read it out loud for our guests to hear, or um, you can raise your hand through Zoom if you want to speak out openly and, well, physically talking. I so love, go ahead. I just want to say I love this comment. It's, it's like kind of the 
only one I'm seeing. It's like a history scavenger hunt. Uh, can I can I borrow that phrase? Yeah, yeah, sure. Like, I really liked how the process of you found things to draw. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, and that's a fan. I like that. I love that phrase. That's good. I, I you know, like, <laughs> um, I don't know. It's been a number of years ago now. Someone referred to me as an activist, right? Because of these lynching landscapes I was painting. I was thinking, I'm not an activist, but, you know, maybe I am because I do want to change the world for better. And I'm actively trying to do that. And, you know, that I'm a historical scavenger. Yeah, because I want all of this country to know that the history that is American history of which African Americans are central to American history. Um, I guess a comment that I really wanted to make in terms of that was one, the pieces were amazing. I really love the story behind them. And I love the concept behind them, especially the last one with like the lynching scene behind it. And also like just quoting what you said, something that really stood out with me was with George Washington chopped down the cherry tree, but he also owned people that looked like me. That was just an amazing quote. <laughs> like that was amazing. And it's something to think about because oftentimes like, yeah, like I would feel the same way as well when you see like another person with the same last name as you, but they don't come from the same background. And you're just kind of like, wow, like, you know, the history behind it. And it's very dark. And just like coming to that, like re revelation is just so like, wow, like, yeah, I, I relate. <laughs> like, it's it's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Pretty much what about George Washington? Hey, let me just a little, little caveat there. There's a recently published book called Never Caught. I can't think of the author's name, but it's the story of Ona Judge, who was at some point in her early life owned by Martha Washington. She self-emancipated herself. I no longer use the term runaway slave. It yeah. They self-emancipated. And George Washington spent the rest of his life trying to recapture Ona Judge. So yeah, he was not a nice person. He was a nasty, nasty man. <laughs> wow, I I never knew that. It's I called either. Never Caught. It's book. called Never Been Caught? Never Caught. Never Caught, okay, thank you. And it's also, it's also said a lot about when you grow up. Like when you're younger, you're taught this myth, the myth. And I think there's this one book, there's this one, there's this one book that I read Fred was particularly called, you know, this we it's kind of very well known that Tom Jefferson had this lady girl that he likes to to rape and it calls it a an affair when it was in the book. I looking back, it's sort of and I was young at the time, like ten years old, so I didn't really understand it. But if that was me at that point, I that at that point that book I would have just thrown that book away, like you know. I, I'm having a slightly hard time fully hearing you so I'm trying to put in my earbuds so, but how old did you say you were yeah like I was 10 years old at the time when I read that book you know it was a who was Thomas Jefferson about Jefferson yes and and you do know everybody should know um Sally Hemings yeah I heard about was, it was 14 yeah 14 but, years old when uh Thomas Jefferson started raping her and he was 40 also not a nice man, wrote some really amazing stuff, had some great concepts, but he was but, a pedophile rapist. Excuse me, I know y'all are in high school, but- I'm, Yeah, you know. it's just, we, we understand. <laughs> no problem, we've probably seen worse. Can I- I don't know. <laughs> you know, I, I, I sometimes, there's, a, there's another great book. Uh, um, Octavia Butler. It's called Kindred. Um, if y'all kind of are into like science fiction. So Kindred is about this black woman. It's written in 1979, which blew my mind, um, who time travels back to uh, slavery South. It's, it's an amazing book about how it, it allows you to really imagine how horrendous it would have been to have skin color like this to live in those times. It's not good now either, but 
It would have been awful back then. Um, okay. So, um, I just have a lot to say um, about your work, specifically because I like to do um, artwork where it has a message where it represents a certain thing. Now, when I first took a look at your artwork, um, especially specifically the paintings, I do a lot of paintings as well. I'm not really good at landscape, so obviously I was looking at your methods and I was, I was thinking, ooh, I'm gonna do a sweetly one next week or something like that. But um, as soon as you told me what was behind them, it just completely changed. Like as soon as I saw it, I felt heavy. Like it felt like, um, I, I like wrote, I described it as like, I got low key scared, but not necessarily. It was just like one of those, like, um, it kind of felt heavy when to look at. And I just, I just want to know, like, um, when you were making these paintings during your thinking process, were you really thinking of like the hardships or like the, like some sort of pain? Because like, at first, when you look at it, it feels nice. But once you get the feeling, it kind of like, you, when you look at the paintings, it feels like you put your own feelings into that work. I was wondering if it was like, you were like, obviously, you sound very passionate about the subject. So I'm going to assume that, yes, you were like, I'm going to do this because of this. But uh, yeah, some, of them, yeah. some of them look really elegant, really beautiful. So I good. was just like, how, you know? Good, good. So, um... I forgot exactly what I was going to say when I attempted to interrupt you, and I'm sorry for trying to inter for interrupting there. Um, I mean, I love painting, right? So, so the activity of painting is actually very joyful for me. Like, I love it. Like when I'm in my studio and I got these big paintings, and I've got my music blast, and I'm like playing air guitar. I love Jimi Hendrix, and I'm like playing air guitar and painting, and like just having a great time. So I. I think, and I love color, especially I love color. Uh, so I hope that some of that comes through in the mark making. But yes, there hopefully is the underlying tension in these places. So like I say, my, my inspiration, I got to find another word. That, that um, was my question because um, mark making, um, to like describe emotion, like regularly, I would probably especially with the topic you were on, I would have done heavy, like hard felt strokes, but yours are very soft and really well-rounded. What made you do that decision? No, actually it's great. And this is, it's, it's, the answer is really twofold. And you know, it. I'm we're, 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 we're all artists here, right? So it's those squiggly marks that I figured out how to draw and paint with. Right. Because I, I like some of you all can like you make a mark and it is three or four marks and it is a perfect portrait. Right. I, I'm not nearly that good. I got to like creep up on it with these squiggly wiggly marks. Right. And then finally it kind of comes together and looks kind of like a face. The other thing with the squiggly marks, I'm also um, I've always been intrigued with uh, theoretical physics and string theory. So they are all, it's all these squiggly marks, thinking about vibrating energy. Mm. And so that's, that's the way they are constructed. That's a part of my thinking. Um, great books. Those of you who are into theoretical physics, that's understandable. An author named Michio Keiku um, has written several accessible books that talk about this very abstract physics. Um, so I, I, represents energy. That's, yeah. I'll quote that for myself as well. So hopefully like all those squiggly marks, like there's a beauty, but there's a tension and there's an, an activity and there's no comfortable place for your eyes to rest in any of these paintings because it's all the sort of dubious energy. Thank you. The other part, though, the Hudson River School painters, right, they were painting in the middle of the 1800s. And their paintings are these big vistas of these wide open, quote, virgin lands, right? But what was happening in this country in the middle of the 1800s, right? There was a civil war. There was the Trail of Tears. It was anything but a peaceful land. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, Kai, I know you had some questions. I don't know if you want to 
put them back into the chat or if you want to take the floor. Take the floor. Ask them. One of my questions was already answered. It was about the, the squiggly lines, but you just answered that. But my, I think my first question was, what made you want to teach art? <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's actually a really great job. Question, rather. Um, let's see. A couple of folks in my life asked me if I wanted to teach a class. My actual, actually, my first art teaching job was teaching at Boston College. And I just, you know, someone who knew me uh, was aware of a job opening at, at BC and asked me if I wanted to teach it. And I said, yes. And then the next time it happened was when Marcia Lloyd and asked if I wanted to come in and teach uh, painting at, at Mass Art. And I said, hell yes. <laughs> but I didn't, I didn't know that I wanted to teach art. Um, clearly, my life knew that I wanted to teach art because I, I absolutely love my job. I have a great job. You know, being in a classroom with, with folks like you all, um, guiding and helping you all do stuff that you already do. Like every child, every little kid, three things every little kid does regardless of ability to the best of their ability. They sing, they dance, and they draw. And so all I'm doing is really helping my students remember that they, you know, when they were, when y'all were two and three and four years old, you were drawing all the time. I'm just like, yep. That's the kind of mark that does that look. Thank you. You're welcome. I have a question. Yes. Um, Kate, so good to be with you today, and thank you so much for sharing with us. Um, and I so miss being on campus with oh, all right. of y'all. Right. <laughs> Keep That's going. Part, right? um, but I love your work, and um, I love your honesty about what it's about, your journey in your life. And I often struggle sometimes with, even in my own work, when you're talking about hard things how not to be kind of heavy handed and, and scream at people with the rage, with the frustration, with, you know, that you have about this stuff, because ultimately you want them to see, you want them to look, you want to hold their gaze and get them to just kind of linger in what you're trying to show them. Mm -hmm. How did you arrive to the space that you are now to, to know how to have this very charged, heavy, stuff that you're bringing, but do it in such a way that before you said anything, we're just looking like, oh, these are pretty. Oh, these are gorgeous. These are pretty. And then you tell us the story and then we're like, okay, oh, wait a minute. So how did you get there? Because I feel like for a lot of artists, especially artists of color, we're aware of like really just jacked up stuff right. in, in our lives, in our neighborhoods, in our history, all this stuff. And we're pissed and we want to talk about it. But the first instinct is almost to yell. Right. And even the way that we draw something is really like, oh, but to be subtle and to be beautiful. How did you get there? That's, that's actually that's a, a really good question. Um, so and, and so there are a couple of ways to approach teaching. Right. Which and on some levels, I don't really think of my my artwork as teaching, but it absolutely carries a message. And um, I have just found in my own life, when someone is like pounding me over the head with stuff, I tend to reject it, right? That's going to be my, if, if someone is telling me I've got to do something, the rebellious youngest child in my family, part of me is like, no, I don't. I'm not going to, right? But if I can get drawn into something, and this is what I'm trying to do with my paintings and drawings is draw the viewer in so that then they have an aha moment. Because it is my, my belief 
that the aha moments, those kind of teaching moments are the ones that last and change people. Um, you know, telling a racist they're a racist is not going to change them, right? Um, convincing them that, you know, we're all human beings and it's actually a economic system that we need to be struggling against. You know, subtly you can convince people to change um, or at least to look at things differently. So the, so the idea with the work was really to, and I like making beautiful things. Right? Um, I really wasn't interested in making didactic, ugly work. Um, and ugly can also be beautiful, but that's not what I wanted to make. I love beautiful things. The craft in the work is also very important. Like the corners of the folds on the canvas is like, you know, that's important to me as mixing the right cadmium with the right cobalt paint. Um, and I, I don't think I'm directly answering your question, so ask it again. <laughs> Well, no, I think you did. Just this idea okay. of, of beauty and aesthetics, like wanting to tell your story in a way that people want to kind of look at. And also you talked about you, know, you don't want to force it, you know, like you just said that, you know, if somebody's just on you to do it, you're like, eh, so right. that subtlety. And, and yeah, so that good. Thank you. So that reminded me. So a major part of my thinking about this is who is the audience that I want to hit with these paintings, right? And I can see these paintings living in places like the Museum of Fine Arts, like the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And most of the audiences of those places are middle and upper class white folks. So that's who I'm trying to target so that they get to sort of think about the land that they occupy in Concord and Lincoln and other places is like, oh, wait, something else might have happened in this space. So again, if, if it was like finger pointing didactic work, it would be easy to reject. If it's work that you are drawn into and spend time looking at um, and ideally admiring and then read the story about what happened. Uh, when I, <clears throat> excuse me, when I exhibit the landscape paintings, I always include the little newspaper article that describes what happened in these places. So mostly people look at the paintings and then read what they are about and then have that aha moment. And really the same thing with the, with the Black Lives drawings, right? So they are slightly larger than life and they are hung so that the audience, you have to look up at them, right? So they're all nice, lovely, beautiful people as we are, but it forces the audience to look up at them, right? Rather than looking down on them or looking at eye level. I'm always kind of thinking about, not always, but I do think about the audience and, and the impact that the work will have. Hi, Keith. It's nice to, to meet you. I think I've seen you around at Mass Talk. You have. Absolutely yes. have. <laughs> <laughs> I have. Um, so your work is amazing. And I know it speaks a lot to like the past and the past can be like very tragic. And even the present, like the present right now is like, it's not doing too good. I wanted to ask you like, does it like discourage you that you're getting more inspiration now? Like, you know, like you're getting inspired to make even more work that's speaking to like more tragedy that's currently happening right now. Like, especially like um, during the summer when it was like really hot, just really hot, especially for like black folks. Yeah, so what's, what's the question? I think I got like, the question. Um, do, you, do, you like, uh, <laughs> do you get discouraged to um, create more work during these times? So, yeah, again, that's another great question. Um, I was thinking about 
really from as as the COVID pandemic was unfolding, right? And we all went into lockdown in March. And then the God, it's gonna make me tear up. We we were those of us who watched the news, we were forced to watch the torture murder of George Floyd over and over and over again, right? I was thinking, oh my God, like stuff is happening so fast, I cannot keep up. And if, you know, I'm not a fast artist. There are others of you, of us, who are like really prolific and knock stuff out. Like, you know, these full body self portraits but you know, I'm doing like one a year. (laughs) And the way things unfold right now, you gotta be doing stuff like, you know, 10 a day, it seems. Uh, But at some point I realized, you know, I just need to continue to do what I do at the pace that I do it, right? And I'm actually, and I sadly don't sell a lot of work. (laughs) So in some ways I'm making work for posterity for the future anyway. Um, So, but also as, as this pandemic has unfolded, I do have an idea for my next project. And it is something about viruses and the ways that virus, like the COVID virus is invisible. I would also say that racism and white supremacy is invisible like a virus and it infects us like a virus. So my next project is going to be something about racism, white supremacy um, as a very deadly virus that goes unseen but kills people all the time. Yeah, so, you know, there's, there's, for the kind of work I do, um, you know, maybe it's just part of, of the human condition, life on planet Earth. You know, there's always stuff that needs to be worked on and improved and made better for lives. And I'm just, you know, I think really as artists, we are all really lucky in the ways that we can express our emotional stuff, good, bad, and indifferent through art, right? You know, I, I think about people who, who have other kinds of occupations and they don't necessarily have a, a ready way to release those emotions. Right? If, if, I'm, if I'm like in a really awful space, I can literally go throw paint at the wall. I can like, you know, I can just like expel that energy. Or if I'm feeling like really wonderful, I can do that kind of soft, wonderful, joyful energy. Right. But, you know, if I was an accountant, I don't know what you do with numbers when you're pissed. <laughs> do you like mess up somebody's books? I don't know. <laughs> or like when you're feeling really good, you're like, you know, <laughs> do something else. Uh, you know, so anyway. <laughs> also, if any of you want to look more at my work, KeithMorrisWashington.com.